Well, um, this morning as we venture into another portion of Luke's account of Jesus, I must admit that I'm, I'm going there with a bit of fear and trepidation. Um, I already know what you think of genealogies in the Bible. I know when we read our Bibles, it's one of those times to kind of kick into gear the Evelyn Wood speed reading. You, uh, you fly over it really low. I mean, after all, we have a lot of good excuses, don't we? we? We can't pronounce the names most of the time. And after all, a lot of those people from the Old Testament, we don't even know, let alone the fact that these genealogies aren't, aren't even sentences. They're not even full thoughts. And so as we read them, we say, well, what is the relevance of me to me in all of this? Um, you might be wondering, since I don't speak very often on Sunday morning, how did you get stuck with the Sermon on Genealogies? I mean, I, I, some of you might be picturing Joe and Brandon kind of in the back room, and, and Joe says, do you want it? And Brandon says, no, I don't want it. Back and forth, hey, we'll give this one to Hutch. He'll handle this one. Well, I, I want to tell you something before I begin today, and that is I actually requested this passage. I actually requested this message particularly. And it may be, maybe will sound rather nerdish to you, but the genealogies have had great meaning for me. And I hope that as we look a little bit more deeply into them, that they will have greater meaning for you also. We're going to look primarily at the message from Luke, but we'll be branching a little bit to touch on just the subject overall of, of genealogies. Um, so, I've been teaching at Biola and Talbot for over 30 years now and have taught Life of Christ for almost that whole time. I, I must admit, in my earlier years, I did skip over passages that I, that I really didn't want to deal with in class. And, and, of course, the genealogies are one of those very convenient ones that we can skip over. And I did that for several years, and then I had a student, an international student in one of my classes, who really got my attention. And came to me, she said, could I talk to you after class? And I said, sure, I'll be glad to. This was the day that I had skipped over the genealogies. She said, I want to tell you a little story in my country in Africa that I came from. Uh, when I was a little girl, no one had ever heard of Jesus. And we, we had missionaries come to visit both our country and particularly in our vill village, and they began translating the scriptures, I, I think if I remember right, it was a Wycliffe team of translators who came in. And she said, our, our people had no interest whatsoever in Jesus. Even after they were translating all the stories, they really didn't care. Until, until they came to one particular passage. Guess what it was? The genealogy of Jesus. Because you see, in that culture, genealogies were very important. And for someone to have a genealogy meant that they were an important person, and maybe we ought to learn more about them. Maybe we ought to listen to them. And my student told me the story that after this genealogy was translated, people began to take more of an interest, and they actually did read the book of Luke and understand it a bit more. And as time went along, both she and many of the folks in her village became Christians. You see, after that conversation, I felt very ashamed because something doesn't mean anything to me doesn't mean that it isn't important. And I discovered that this is a very cultural thing. While we might skip over and read over very quickly genealogies, in many places a genealogy means a great deal. It says something about a person and says something about who they are and brings them honor. So I want to, I want to take a minute to think a little bit about Luke, and indirectly we're also thinking about Matthew. Why were these genealogies so important in the story of Jesus? Well, both in the Jewish and in the Greek-Roman cultures, genealogies served a very important purpose. I jotted down some thoughts here that I actually want to read verbatim just because I think, for me, this helped to capture what genealogies were all about. Both the Jews and the Gentiles used genealogies as a means of writing history. They were summarized, shortened statements about a person's identity, and especially to magnify that person's status because of the pedigree and the family background that the person had. In both the Greek, Roman, and the Jewish cultures, a genealogy, and this is very important, a genealogy was a way of bringing honor 
to someone because you declared things about that person's family background. The question of who's your daddy, and even sometimes who's your mama, that question was a very important one in ancient cultures. So in the Jewish context, genealogies took on an even greater meaning, especially if your pedigree, if your genealogy had anything to do with with David from the Old Testament. You may remember there were promises about David that from David would come ultimately a Messiah. So Jews very carefully kept records who had anything to do with the line of David. Uh, Some of them were kept orally so that they just knew in their family what their what their background was, but those who were particularly in the Messianic line would actually have written genealogies that were kept on record at the temple in Jerusalem until that temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And we believe that possibly the genealogy that Luke has in his account in Luke 3 and also over in Matthew 1 were both genealogies that may have been on record. In fact, I find it rather convincing that this is a part of the proof who Jesus was as a Messiah, but we find no evidence in history that anyone ever disputed the genealogies of Jesus. They may likely have been a part of the public record. So we often think of Jewish genealogies as being very important, but even in the Greek-Roman culture, and of course, as Luke writes, he's writing to those from that Greek-Roman culture. Genealogies were also important there, especially if you were a VIP or someone in a higher echelon of society, you could trace your line to someone important. And, and many of the rulers, many of those who were very important people, would trace their line to the Greek gods. Now, we know that the Greek gods didn't really exist, but that genealogy traced back to the Greek gods was their way of showing how important they were or showing some kind of a prestige within their society. I uh, reproduced something not f- online, and it actually the quality of it came out pretty poorly, but I wanted to give you an idea out of the Greek-Roman culture, something that was very common in the use of genealogies. This was called a stemma. A stemma was actually a documenting of your family background through drawn pictures. Remember, there are no photographs at that time, so they would be drawn pictures. Some cases, even, even a wax mask of an ancestor And then, as you can see from the diagram here, they would draw lines between them to show the family relationships that were there. And a very wealthy person would often place the stemma right in a prominent place in their home. Uh, They would put it in a a visible wall where folks coming in could see, and it was was in a sense a part of bragging who they were, that that they had this family background, this prestigious background. And so in the Greek-Roman culture, It was a big deal to know who you were connected with in family and what that meant. Um, In our home, we've done something similar to that. Uh, Leah, I know, after she began to take an interest in in, uh, home decorating and design, she gathered together a whole group of pictures of family members that go way back like to my great-grandfather. And in addition to that, all the way through the generations to my grandchildren, and she would organize them on the wall. Now, we didn't draw lines between them to connect them genealogically, but when folks would come over, anyone who might have an interest, you know how that is. You'll stop at the wall and say, well, this is an interesting collage of pictures. Who is this? And here's an important point. It allowed us, it allowed us to begin to tell stories. And usually those stories could be very boring, so we tried to keep them short. But that stemma, if you will, that stemma on the wall of our home actually served the same kind of purpose because genealogies inevitably are not just names of people, but genealogies are stories. They're stories about the background of that people, of of people. Now, I want to think for a moment with you. We're actually going to fairly briefly deal with Luke's genealogy today, but I'd like you to think how genealogies in the Bible are really more connected with with the purpose of each of the gospel writers. We have four gospels all together. Mark is a really interesting gospel because Mark is presenting to us Jesus as a servant, as a doulos, if you will, the word that we might use in the Greek-Roman culture. What was 
important about a servant? Well, his genealogy was not important. In fact, for most slaves in the Greek-Roman culture, you would not even keep a genealogy. You would not even have a genealogy. So Mark begins his gospel appropriately with no genealogy whatsoever. And we're launched right in Mark chapter 1 into the stories of the ministry of Jesus. John the Baptist followed by the temptation account. So appropriately, Mark does not have a genealogy because it really doesn't fit his purpose of presenting Jesus as the doulos or the slave. Jumping, out, jumping over to John's gospel, we see something a little different. Not a traditional human genealogy, but what I like to call a divine genealogy. You remember those words in John chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We find out later in chapter, in, in chapter 1 verse 14 that the Logos is in fact Jesus, the one who came and dwelt among us. So what is John doing as he begins his gospel? He is saying, that Jesus was in the beginning with God, and in fact he was God. What we could truly call a divine genealogy fits very closely with the purpose of John's gospel because John is now writing much later to the early church as they were battling through the issue of whether Jesus was truly God. And John is writing indirectly to heretics who have denied that Jesus is God and so his divine genealogy, if you will, in chapter 1, is really addressing that whole issue. No, no, the Lagos, Jesus, was in the beginning, and he was with God, and he was God. It's in Luke's gospel, of course, we've been looking more closely at Luke. It's in Luke's gospel that we really find an, a genealogy that is connected with the humanness of Jesus. You're going to find, you're going to find in your bulletin a uh, genealogy actually right out of scripture for Luke. I suspected that you would not read through this in your quiet time this week, but I wanted to, I wanted to put the whole text. Carly, great, uh, thankfully, was willing to put both Luke's and Matthew's gospel, to, uh, the uh, genealogy together there. But I've, I put up on the screen here a bit of a shortened form of the 77 names that appear in Luke's gospel. Now here's Here's where I think it's important for us to summarize bit, a bit and, and to actually try to focus. What was Luke really interested in? Luke is going to present to us in his gospel, week by week as we look at it, he's going to present to us the universal message of Jesus, that he's not just a Messiah to the Jews, but he's a Messiah to the Gentiles as well. And not only that, but that Luke is presenting to us that Jesus is truly human, that he has human roots, and as a human being, he became our Messiah. So Luke's present presentation is taking us back, and if I could let a few of these names jump out of the genealogy, I think these are ones that Luke was particularly interested in. He wanted to show that Jesus' family line went back through some very important people, and if we start in the middle there, He's giving to us some messianic promises from the Old Testament. Matthew does the same thing, actually. But he's telling us that this Jesus came from the one Judah who was prophesied to be, to be the ancestor of the Messiah. Remember that expression? The lion of the tribe of Judah, a prophecy that comes out of the words or comes out of the description of who Judah was. Even more important, though, you can see the second name that I've highlighted here is the name of David. David was extremely important both to Jew and Gentile in anyone's genealogy because they knew there had been very clear promises, even a covenant that God made in 2 Samuel. We looked at that earlier in our series um, in, in the uh, books of the Old Testament that Jesus came from this line of David, from this promised line of David. And he, in fact, is now the fulfillment of the son of David. The term son of David in Jesus' day had become synonymous with, with the term Messiah. And so if you referred to the son of David, everyone knew what you meant, that Jesus is, in fact, a descendant of David. We move a little bit further, and of course he mentions Abraham also. Abraham is not just meaningful to Jews, but... To Abraham was given this promise that, Abraham, through you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. 
not just through the Jewish people that came from Abraham, but one day there would be a Messiah through Abraham's line that all the nations would be blessed. So, so Luke here is definitely making a point among these names, making a point that these are, this is a messianic genealogy, that Jesus is in fact our Messiah. But now we find perhaps the, the most important name of all down at the very bottom, and that is he traces the genealogy all the way back to Adam, the first man. Matthew doesn't do this in his genealogy in chapter 1. He, he stops with Abraham because, remember, his, his readers, Jews, would have been interested primarily in their Jewish background. But, Adam, uh, but uh, Luke does go all the way back to Adam. And he's telling us that this Jesus, the Messiah, the one who God had sent, is also a son of Adam. In fact, I think a case can be made all the way through the Gospel of Luke that that Luke is particularly interested in presenting to us the humanity of Jesus. Not, not that he denies the deity. In fact, he has deity all over in his gospel. But he's particularly interested. This genealogy would be a good example where he takes, makes the effort to trace the genealogy all, all the way back to the first man, the first human being, Adam. But, but it's more than that. As we look into Luke's writings, we find some stories that just don't appear anywhere else. You remember the story of Jesus, the announcement when Jesus is going to be born to Mary. That only appears in Luke's gospel. The, even the birth story, we're going to be celebrating that in just a few weeks at Christmas time. That only appears in Luke's gospel. We really only have the full Christmas story, in a sense, in Luke's gospel. And I think what Luke was attempting to do was to show not just who Jesus is as the Messiah, but also who he is as a human Messiah. That is, he is born into the human race and qualified, therefore, to come and be the Savior of everyone. In fact, there's a, a debated point. Uh, I'm not going to have the time to try to, to try to give you my argument for what, why this is, but there's a debated point that what we may be looking at in Luke's Gospel may be the genealogy of Mary, even though her name doesn't appear here. And the reason some have been led to that, that uh, conclusion, not everyone agrees on this, so I'm not dogmatic about this one. But the reason some have been led to this conclusion is the way that Luke introduces the genealogy. And he makes the note, kind of what we might call a parenthetical note, that this, this Jesus was supposed to be, that is, people thought of him as the son of Joseph. Both Luke and Matthew make a very strong point that Jesus is not the son of Joseph physically. He is legally the son of Joseph, but not physically the son of Joseph. And Luke seems to be making this right at the beginning of his genealogy. It was, it was supposed by the common people that he was an illegitimate son of Mary and Joseph. But Luke goes on then to trace a genealogy, and one point of view at least is that Mary's name would not be mentioned because a mother's name is never a part of a genealogy custom-wise. It would only be the father's. But Mary would be behind the scenes here. And in fact, whoops. In fact, if I forget how I use a pointer here, but the name Heli, the name Heli is actually going to be the line of Mary. Now, I need to say, in all honesty, that scholars have disagreeing views on this. Some say, no, this is Joseph's genealogy. Others say that this is Mary's genealogy. However you slice it, whatever your view, you still come to the very bottom with the name of Adam. And you know that one of, one of Luke's main purposes was to show the human roots of Jesus. I think even more so that if he's tracing, tracing Mary's genealogy, that he was attempting to show us a very difficult point to make, and that is, this is the human line of Jesus all the way back to Adam. Remember, Jesus only has one human parent, and so to trace this line would be difficult when that human parent is his mother. And so some have suggested at least this may be Mary's genealogy, others have said not. Now let me go back to a very simple point about genealogies, and then I want to share with you a, a personal story. Genealogies were a way to bring honor to a person. 
and also to a family. Even though a genealogy was brief, each of the names found in that genealogy represented stories. And some of those names were more important than others, would stand out more than others, as we have seen here. And that, that experience of looking at a genealogy is very different than our experience. Most of the time, we don't know the stories behind all of the names. So as we read it, we tend to just speed read over everything. But a Jew or a, a Gentile who was knowledgeable about some of these stories would have realized that this is really saying a great deal about Jesus, uh, another way in a sense of, of writing uh, history. I recently had a genealogical experience. Um, many of you know that my mom uh, passed away in early, in early August. In fact, uh, some of you may even have been here the morning, just a few days before she passed away, that I was, I was doing the benediction on that morning. And unknown to you, I was sitting out there getting all kinds of text messages. Now, I've, I've heard the warnings from Brandon and others. We're not supposed to look at our phones, OK? So I usually don't pay attention to text messages. But when they started buzzing over and over, I knew something's going on. And my mom is 94, was 94, so I knew that that could be it. Sure enough, I looked at my daughter had written, Grandma may not make it through the day today. My mom lives, lived up in, the north, up in the Northwest. And uh, so I finished that service. I even shared, I think, a little bit with some of you what was going on. And, uh, and afterward, I was talking with Dan Olson, who happened to be around the whole morning because of a missions activity that morning. And Dan says, I heard your story. Why aren't you on a plane up to go see your mom? I said, well, I've got to do the benedictions for the other two services. Dan says, are you kidding? He says, I'll take care of the services. You get your airline reservation. Sure enough, Leah had already made it for me, got on a plane that day. I was able to go up and be with my mom in her last three days before she passed away in early August. That was a, that was a difficult time for us, but it was followed by a very glorious time for us. And that is on September the 8th, we as a family had a wonderful memorial service for my mom in the church. This is the picture of the church. By the way, those are all flowers from my mom's garden that she had grown. Uh, we had a memorial service in the church where I had grown up and the church, I might add, where my mom, now brace yourself, my mom had been a member of the same church for 81 years. 81 years. What, a, what an amazing heritage that is. And I was able to share, to, uh, to speak at that service. Very difficult for me, but I knew that I wanted to be the one to tell my mom's story. Leah shared uh, a lot about how she had been welcomed into the family. Our daughter, Kara, told some stories about what it was like to be a grandchild relating to my mom. It was a, it was a glorious day. Um, there were 110 people at that service. When you're 94 years old, that's not too bad because a lot of your friends have already passed and they've already gone. But in that service, as hard as it was, as difficult as it was emotionally, um, I can honestly say that it was the easiest funeral that I've ever done in my life. And the reason for that, and I've done many memorial services and funerals, but the reason for that is all I had to do was to tell my mom's story. To tell my mom's story is to tell the story of the gospel lived out in her life. And as I did that, it was wonderful. So many of the folks who were there were not believers. Some of them were church members at this church, but many of them were coming from outside and it was so wonderful to share just my mom's story. It was not hard at all. After the service, our family went over to a local cemetery and... Um, gathered around just our family and had a committing of my mom's ashes to the earth and just a very, very short ceremony. And I hadn't anticipated, knowing the other service would be the large one, I hadn't anticipated this would be so meaningful to me. I brought a picture this morning to kind of give you a sense because there was the grave of my mom and dad together. My grandparents' grave was there and even my great-grandparents on my grandmother's side were there. My name is John Charles Hutchison IV, and I actually have a great heritage in my fathers and my grandfathers who are all named the same thing. 
But on that day, as I stood there with my grandkids beside me and looked at the graves of my great-grandparents, I realized this is, this is really an amazing experience because, because, you see, it isn't just that I had a father and a grandfather with the same name. It's that I had a godly mother and, a, and behind her a godly grandmother who are the very reason that I'm in Christian ministry today. I'm, I'm serious. I'm standing here today because of the prayers and the influence of my mother and my grand, grandmother. And as I finished that day and reflected a lot on it later on, I realized how grateful I am for my genealogy, how grateful I am for the relationships that I have. Um, I need to clarify a bit. Our family was not perfect. We all don't have moms exactly like my mom, and there's all kinds of stories that are not necessarily positive stories in our families. But I, I, really, I really believe that it's important that we value our ancestry, that we value our heritage in some way, and maybe even to find out a bit more about that. And that's, that's essentially what the Jews and the Gentiles were doing during Jesus' time. They were giving honor to those who had gone before them through the story of a genealogy, remembering the stories. And as we sat around as a family that day, we remembered so many stories about my mom and about the influence that she had had on a lot of us. Well, I, I'm going to finish, and I'm going to do this very briefly, but I feel like I would like to go also to, um, to Matthew's genealogy of Jesus. I'm going to, I'm going to just summarize this. And uh, in, in all fairness, there are two great genealogies, Matthew and Luke, of Jesus in the Scriptures. And I think we need to mention Matthew's as well. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, as you can even look the way I've arranged it on the screen, Matthew 1 is a much shorter genealogy. Instead of 77 names from Luke, we only have 42 names in this genealogy. Uh, Matthew obviously was summarizing, and he places these 42 names into three different groups. Three groups, each one is 14 names. Not by accident, by the way, that it's the number 14, a multiple of seven so for Jews, that would have been a very important part. And Matthew is writing to Jews who very likely, because they would see the name of David, they would see the name of David the king at the center of this genealogy. Matthew is writing to them to remind them that Jesus Christ has the pure genealogy that we would attribute to the Messiah. That David is, in fact, in his line. We can go back again to some of the other characters the promises to Abraham. Abraham, through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. We also have not only a reference to Judah, but also this reference to David. And then, so important, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, it had actually specified that Messiah is going to come through the line of David's son who builds the temple. Well, who was that, of course? That was Solomon. And so as Matthew traces this genealogy, he gives to us a very clear-cut argument that this genealogy was, in fact, the Messianic genealogy. Uh, I believe the, name, the reason he likely organized it in the way that he did is many Jews who wanted to, to uh, believe in Jesus as their Messiah, they would have actually memorized this. Amazingly, isn't it? We, we skip over genealogies when we read them, and the Jews, for especially a genealogy of David, would have memorized this, believing that Jesus was like the, their Messiah. But before I leave Matthew's genealogy, I want to mention one other feature that I have found through the years quite fascinating. And that is, in the genealogy itself, we find the names of four women appearing that really did not have to be there. Matthew is actually, he's actually departing from the rules of genealogies, if you will, because you didn't usually mention the mother's names. Every once in a while you find mother's names, but not very often. And Matthew mentions four different women here who, looking back in Old Testament history, really had a significant role. Now, if you know anything about the names Tamar and Rahab and Bathsheba, who is called here the wife of Uriah, if you know anything about those names, you know there was a lot of scandal here, that the mentioning of, this, of these women would have really gotten the attention and that's what I think Matthew's point is. He really wanted to get their attention. 
But it's likely not the scandal that is his point, but every one of these stories, remember, names are stories. Every one of these stories were stories of Gentiles who had a tremendous faith and at their time in history, various times in Jewish history, at their time in history, they actually put the Jews to shame in their great faith. And so, so I believe that Matthew's intent in interjecting these women's names was to remind his fellow Jews, folks, we need to remember that at times it was the Gentiles who had greater faith than we did. If you're interested in more detail on this, um, a few years ago I actually had an interest in writing an article on it. And I'd be glad to share that with you if you just want to, my email is on the back of the bulletin. If you just want to email me, I'll just uh, send off to you a copy of that article. The women in Matthew's genealogy remind us of the importance of the universal message. Luke is going to emphasize that Jesus is the Messiah of the world, but Matthew is also going to have his own tricky way of interjecting here that Jesus is both the Messiah of the Jews, but he's also the Messiah of the Gentiles as well. Now, let me close with just a couple of few thoughts. Um, what take-home points can you give for a genealogy? Well, first of all, I don't think I need to convince you, but Jesus for sure is the Messiah. This genealogy, the one in Luke and the one in Matthew, as well as many, many fulfilled prophecies in the gospel, leave us with a clear proof who Jesus is. No one could have accidentally come along in history and fallen into these circumstances or fallen into these particular families. It had to be that this Jesus who came into the earth and came into the world is truly the prophesied Messiah. Why is that important? Because the most important decision you will make in life is what do I do with Jesus? Am I going to believe in him? I, am I going to embrace him? In our Christian terminology, we, we would say, am I going to receive him as Savior? Am I going to look to him as my Lord? The proofs that are all over there in the Gospels, including in the genealogies, are that Jesus is really who he says he is. And every one of us, Every one of us have the responsibility to make a decision about that. I don't know where you are in that decision. I'm assuming most of you have already made that. But it's the most important decision you will make in your life. Secondly, this is very encouraging to me as I go out as a Christian. It's very clear from Scripture that Jesus is not just the Messiah of an elite group of people, of a very small group of people, but he is a universal Messiah. The book of Luke makes this clear in the gospel, or the genealogy, makes it clear that he is the son of Adam, that he goes all the way back to Adam. And it's that universal message that gives us permission to step out of these doors and to step out of this church and to share the gospel with everyone. It's applicable, it's relevant to everyone, whether Jew or Gentile, whatever their background. That great commission that we've been given by God is a serious message. One last personal take-home idea, and this is one that has impacted me as I shared a little bit earlier, and that is you and I are all parts of genealogies. You and I have a heritage of our past. You may not care about that. In our culture, there's a tendency to kind of rip ourselves away from our past at times, but you are a part of your past, and there's great value as I have tried to do with some of my relatives, including my mom, is great value in learning a little bit about the heritage that you have. I don't mean necessarily just going online and tracing your, uh, your background in Ancestry.com. What I'm talking about is the stories, the stories of people, finding out a little bit more about them. And when we do, or as we do, I believe that we become richer. We become richer in our identity. Who am I as a person? I'd remind you also that you are a part of the genealogy of your kids and your grandkids. And how you live is very, very important. That heritage that's passed on to them will be an important part of their future as well. And it, it, it leaves us with a sense of the importance of living every day to honor God so that we will be able to pass something on
to those who follow us. So you and I are part of a genealogy, whether we like them or not. And we are truly a part of a great story, a great story as Christians. Let's pray together.